Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the GAIN Center's webinar, Medication-Assisted Treatment for Opioid Use Disorder in Correctional Settings, Notes from the Field. And we really appreciate you joining us today. I am Melissa Neal, a Senior Research Associate with Policy Research Associates and the lead for communications out of the GAIN Center. And I just have a couple of housekeeping remarks. First, the views, opinions, and content expressed in this presentation do not necessarily reflect the views, opinions, or policies of the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, the National Sheriff's Association, or the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Throughout the presentations, we welcome you to submit questions. You will see on the right side of your screen uh, a little portal called Q&A. You can click that to expand that section and enter in questions at any time. If you do have questions for a particular presenter, you may want to make that clear as we will not address questions until all of the presentations are ended. You may have also noticed on the right side of your screen that a poll has popped up. Um, we welcome your, present, your participation. This helps us learn who has joined us and, and, and the, the kinds of locations and agencies that you are joining us from. This webinar is being recorded. We will be disseminating slides via the GAINS listservs uh, in a few days. And we also will distribute the YouTube link to the recording of this webinar once it's approved and posted to the SAMHSA YouTube channel. And uh, as always, we have a certificate of attendance available for download. And this is for personal use only. We do not provide CEU credits. Just a quick look at our agenda. Um, we are excited to have some opening remarks from John Berg at SAMHSA. And then we will have three presentations. Carrie Hill is presenting on more of the national level of, and, and describing the national scene of the use of medication-assisted treatment in jail settings. Sheriff Furman and Dr. Rye will be describing their MAT program in Denver, Colorado. And Dr. Jennifer Clark will be talking about uh, the MAT program at the Rhode Island Department of Corrections. And then, of course, we will have some time at the end of the presentations to cover your questions. But for now, I'd like to turn it over to John Berg, who's a Senior Public Health Advisor for the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment at, uh, at SAMHSA. John? Thank you so much, Dr. Neal. Welcome to today's webinar on medication-assisted treatment for opioid use disorder in correctional settings, notes from the field. We appreciate you taking the time today to participate in today's informative webinar. SAMHSA is interested in promoting policies and practices to lower the risk of overdose for persons with op opioid use disorder who are or have been in contact with the criminal justice system. There is overwhelming evidence that medication-assisted treatment is an effective intervention for addressing opioid use disorders in criminal justice populations. Our focus today is to present justification and support for implementing MAT in criminal justice settings, provide insight into current MAT programs in criminal justice settings, and provide solutions for overcoming barriers to MAT implementation. SAMHSA recently released an evidence-based resource guide titled Use of Medication-Assisted Treatment for Opioid Use Disorder in Criminal Justice Settings. It was actually released last week. This guide focuses on using medication-assisted treatment for opioid use disorder in jails and prisons and during the reentry process when justice-involved persons return to the community. It provides an overview of policies and evidence-based practices that reduce the risk of overdose and relapse. Another resource provided today is a recently released SAMHSA document entitled Medication-Assisted Treatment in the Criminal Justice System, a Brief Guidance to the States. This brief provides guidance to state governments on increasing the availability of evidence-based medication-assisted treatment in criminal justice settings. Both documents are provided today as a resource and can be found on the SAMHSA website. We are excited to host today's webinar. Today's presenters will provide personal insights and share from their expertise on how to implement and manage effective MAP programs in criminal justice settings. They will share about some of the challenges they have faced and lessons learned along the way.
We are pleased to have four experts in this field present today. Carrie Hill, who served on the expert panel for the recently released document on use of MAT for opioid use disorder in criminal justice settings. Sheriff Patrick Furman and Dr. Sasha Rye of Colorado and Dr. Jennifer Clark, Medical Program Director for Rhode Island Department of Corrections. Her state MAP program is featured in the recently released SAMHSA document that I just mentioned. I would also like to thank the Gaines Center and their staff for their work in developing and facilitating today's webinar. At this time, I will return it back to Dr. Neal. Thanks. Thank you so much, John. And uh, now we'll just briefly introduce our presenters, um, and you can read much more information about them on these bio slides. Um, first, we have Carrie Hill, who directs the National Center for Jail Operations at the National Sheriff's Association, and um, she provides uh, professional development seminars and, and a number of other con consultations around uh, this issue, as well as correctional law and criminal justice. And um, she was formerly the general counsel to the Utah Department of Corrections, an editor of Corrections Manager's Report, and senior administrative manager to Sheriff Richard Stanick in Hennepin County, Minnesota. Sheriff Patrick Furman has been Denver Sheriff since 2015. However, he has nearly 30 years of experience in, in jail management and uniformed experience. And um, previously, he was the Deputy Chief of Corrections and Deputy Chief and Chief of Corrections for Sheriff Departments in Illinois prior to coming to Denver. He's also previously served as the Vice President of the Board of Directors for the Illinois Correctional Association, an Executive and Certified Auditor for the American Correctional Association, and Auditor for PR, um, PREA, which is Prison Rape and Elimination Act at the U U.S. Department of Justice. He is certified in approved instructional expertise in human behavior by the Illinois Law Enforcement Training and Standards Board, and as an adjunct professor, taught at the College of Lake County and Trinity International University near Chicago. Dr. Rai is an assistant professor of psychiatry at the University of Colorado School of Medicine, and um, as you'll hear today, he's the director of behavioral health services for the Denver Sheriff's Department. And there he oversees an interdisciplinary team of health professionals who provide mental health services and substance use services at the Denver City and County Jails. He is board, board certified in general psychiatry, forensic psychiatry, and addiction medicine. He also uh, directs the forensic psychiatry service at Denver Health. And finally, we have Dr. Jennifer Clark, she is an Associate Professor of Medicine at the Warren Alpert Medical School of Brown University, and she is the Medical Program Director at Rhode Island Department of Corrections. And she's been an internist there since 1998. She's a national leader in expanding access to medications for opiate, opiate use disorders for people in corrections, and she's done a, a number of research um, uh, initiatives on treatment for substance use disorders, women's health, and preventive medicine for incarcerated populations. So those are our presenters today. And right quick before we hand it over to Carrie, um, we have our results from the polls. And we see that a good number of you are joining from urban settings. However, we have just uh, uh, about 30% uh, coming from rural and sub suburban. And it, it's no surprise, but it looks like most of our participants today are calling in from corrections, which is wonderful to hear. Um, but we do see a number of you uh, calling in from different uh, agencies. So welcome so much. And now we will turn it over to Carrie. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Before I, I move forward with that, first of all, Dr. Neal, thank you so much, and John Berg for um, asking um, myself on behalf of the National Sheriff's Association to be part of um, this um, really important discussion and from my uh, panelists and my colleagues um, who I am working with, it's, it's really an honor to be with you today. And on behalf of Jonathan Thompson, our executive director, thank you for um, being engaged and wanting to learn more about um, jail-based medication assisted treatment. One of the things that uh, we know today 
is that more than 10 million individuals pass through our jails and our counties with at least half of those individuals coming into our jails with some substance use disorder, half of whom have some type of opioid um, use disorder. And we know without effective intervention, without effective medications, without effective treatment, those who are most vulnerable remain sick. And while those who are most vulnerable remain sick, we know that the jails were never designed necessarily to be treatment facilities, and yet that has become part of what our jails and our sheriffs face every day. And jails not only oversee those struggling with these substance use disorders and withdrawal, but also are in a unique position to initiate treatment in a controlled and safe environment. And what I'm very excited to talk about is how the National Sheriff's Association and our sheriffs overseeing approximately 85% of the jails throughout the United States are committed to addressing this issue and some of the recent tools and partnerships and collaborations to not only help educate the field, but also try to provide the technical assistance and resources so that are so desperately needed um, for our jails throughout the United States. We know that, uh, that individuals suffering um, from opiate use disorder can benefit from this combination of not only FDA approved medications, and we'll, as we're talking about MAT, so medication assisted treatment, and the FDA currently approved medications, as you'll hear more about today, methadone, buprenorphine, um, or naltrexone, or injectable naltrexone, we also know that when you combine that with the treatment and behavioral health piece, that it actually can increase treatment, treatment retention, it can reduce overdose, and hopefully also reduce criminal activity. Now, historically, it's not been the responsibility of the sheriffs and jails, as I mentioned, to be the primary providers of substance use disorders, but with the number of, of Americans and individuals dying and those recently released from our jails being vulnerable, the situation has changed. And as a result of that, our sheriffs have taken on the challenge. And in 2017, I'm proud to announce that the National Sheriff's Association adopted a resolution to support the most current FDA approved and evidence-based substance or medications to treat substance use disorder uh, within the jails to respond to the opioid epidemic. And sheriffs have become, by the very nature of the epidemic, pioneers in establishing medication-assisted treatment programming, expanding jail medication-assisted treatment. Um, we know now that what started out is only a few within the past year. We are up, up, up and beyond 30 states right now where the jails are starting to provide medication-assisted treatment. One of the things I want to share with you, you, you know, really just a, just a huge shout out to SAMHSA and the federal partners who have all been working collaboratively to help educate the field. And I was really honored to be part of SAMHSA's expert panel as they worked on the releasing of their current document, um, the use of medication-assisted treatment um, in criminal justice settings. In 2018, just this past October, in addition, the federal partners had all come together and NCCHC along with NSA a release what we called jail-based medication-assisted treatment, promising practice guidelines and resources for the field. And one of the main reasons for uh, releasing this document was to help educate the field on what MAT is and how MAT can better assist the field. One of the exciting things about the document, and we'll make sure that you also get a copy of this link, is that it talks about the best practices um, and guidelines for the field to include client enrollment. How do you go about doing that in a jail-based MAT program? The medications um, that are available, dosages, length of the treatment. What about medication-assisted treatment for pregnant females? Um, one of the areas that we are all seeing a rise in is the increase of number of women in our facilities um, and also those being pregnant. What are the proper protocols? In addition, the Promising Practices talks about that medication alone is not enough, that it's truly that treatment piece of it 
that must work together and how do you go about doing that? In addition, the um, promising practices talk about the medication program components, everything that should be a part of that, as well as the importance of client screening to address treatment, continuing um, withdrawal and relapse, and also engaging Medicaid and post-release financial assistance. One of the other things that in addition to the most recently SAMHSA released document, which talks about some of these centers of innovation, the Promising Practices also talks about jails specifically looking at Sacramento, California, Middlesex, Massachusetts, Louisville, Kentucky, Sonoma County, um, Washington, and Rhode Island. And they, what's wonderful about each of all of these different documents for you, and please make sure you reference them, is they'll talk about the origin and the development of their program, some of the outcomes and lessons learned. And last but not least, an appendix referencing some of the screening tools that you can look to um, and address, um, and some of the substance use disorder treatment plans as well that SAMHSA has, um, as well as some of the other partners. So what I can't emphasize enough is our sheriffs throughout the United States are recognizing that MAT is an important um, part of um, the treatment protocol in addressing the opioid um, use um, disorders that are coming that we are seeing more and more with our inmates within the criminal justice environment. But one of the other um, issues that I need to draw your attention to is not only is MAT um, definitely um, recognized as um, the protocol, but also we have to look at some of the litigation challenges that our jails are experiencing. And without going through all of these, what I want to recognize for you within the just the last year alone, our sheriffs and our jails nationally are being challenged for failing to provide medication assisted treatment within the facility. One of the, or both of the allegations that are being raised is number one, that by failing to provide medication assisted treatment to the inmates, that it is a violation of the Eighth Amendment's protection against cruel and unusual punishment, specifically the deliberate indifference um, standard, meaning by failing to provide MAT, the jails are being deliberately indifferent. But what's new, and we will see a change in the law and we're going to be seeing an evolution, is that our jails are also being sued for, for um, violating the Americans with Disabilities Act Title II for not providing medication assisted treatment um, in, the in the facility. And the idea being that the in inmates coming into our facility who have substance use disorders are a qualified individual, and but for the fact that they have a substance use disorder, they would be eligible for some of the medications and treatment that they would um, receive. I'm gonna go back a couple of slides here. So in all of these cases, the Eighth Amendment's Protection Against Cruel and Unusual Punishment and the ADA Title II have all been raised as issues. In Court Laver versus Whatcom County was the first time when one of our sheriffs was sued for failing to provide MAT in a class action. And one of, I just cannot emphasize the value and just the partnership with, that we have with our federal partners. Um, I was able to uh, reach out to the National Institute of Corrections and BJA, and we were able to get Sheriff um, Watcom's um, staff flown out to one of our centers of innovation, which is Middlesex, Massachusetts, to learn about MAT, to come back to Watcom County and implement that. And I'm very um, proud not only of the sheriff um, and his vision, but also that they were able to start a really viable MAT program in their facility. Zachary Smith versus uh, Fitzpatrick was just a very specific situation where an individual who was going to be going to the main, um, to prison, had been on uh, a medication assisted treatment protocol, and at that time the jail um, was denying it and or it would not be continued um, at the prison. And I just want you to know that that case has also been settled, and for Mr. Um, Smith, that regiment is being continued. Pesci versus Coppinger was really one of the first ones that we saw the court getting involved. This was a situation where Mr. Pesci was not even under the jurisdiction of um, Sheriff Coppinger at the time, but had been on a methadone um, protocol for two years. 
He was going to be coming into the facility to serve a 40 day um, sentence. Um, and at that time, um, Sheriff Coppinger actually had a very robust um, withdrawal program and a very robust Vivitrol reentry program, um, but did not have, and at that time was not offering methadone or suboxone. And in this situation, um, the district court issued a preliminary injunction that Mr. Pesci would be receiving the methadone while he was in the sheriff's care, custody, and control. And I'm pleased to announce that uh, he did receive um, that uh, methadone while he was in the sheriff's care, custody, and control. Um, and that um, situation has now um, been resolved. And we'll talk more about Massachusetts and some of the great work that they're doing. In Smith versus Aristook, this is one of our first um, First Circuit, uh, Federal Circuit Court of Appeals decisions where a preliminary injunction was upheld where <clears throat> Ms. Smith was under a regiment of um, buprenorphine and the court, in fact, upheld that she needed to receive that um, coming into the facility. And DePiro versus Her Herwitz is a Massachusetts DOC case um, where, again, the protocol for MAT is going to be continued. What's important to know here is that if you're dealing with an individual coming into your facility with a valid MAT prescription. It is one that needs to be looked at as any other prescription coming in with an inmate. And it's one that we look at um, with our medical treatment providers. It is determined on a case by case basis. And that's really the lessons learned from all of this, but please be aware and protocols in place that say that we do not honor um, we do not honor narcotics in our facility are really a red herring. So please make sure to be aware of that. Although I can't give you legal advice, I really encourage you to talk to county council so that we can all learn from these decisions as we move forward. Not because we're fearful of litigation, but because MAT within our facilities is the right thing to do as we help to address the opioid epidemic. Understanding that not all our jails have access to methadone, and they may not have access to Suboxone, but what are some of the different ways that we can help implement? So very quickly, I just wanna move into, again, some of the options and alternatives. Look at, is the individual coming into your facility, coming in with a valid MAT prescription? Is MAT available in your community? Is there community capacity and sustainability? Those are some of the things that we look at. Again, understanding that methadone may not be available. One of the, uh, challenges that Sheriff Elfo experienced in Whatcom County was that he didn't have a methadone clinic within 60 miles of his facility. So what were some of the other creative ways that he could provide MAT um, to those inmates within his facility? You can consider having stand-up providers come to your facility. Now there are um, providers in the, in the community who have valid licenses that our jail prescribers or, um, and treatment providers may not have, check into maybe they could be able to come in and assist with the valid licenses to assist you. Or consider having other facilities house your, um, the individuals in your facility who require MAT, or is it possible to transport the individual to receive the medications outside of your facility as Sheriff Coppinger um, got, did? So instead of digging our heels in, we have to find a way to yes, and that's one of the really exciting things about um, being able to help educate the field regarding MAT um, and to our jails. One of the things that I just wanna to touch on real quickly is really some of the creative ways that our sheriffs are taking the lead, Massachusetts being one, and I'm not gonna go through every slide so we can get to all of our presenters. But what I want you to know, when the Massachusetts sheriffs were under pressure from the legislature that they, the legislature was going to impose all forms of MAT, the sheriff stepped up to help educate the legislature on really some of the challenges with MAT, some of the costs, and some of the programs that were currently um, in place. And what happened with this wonderful collaboration, the sheriffs, seven sheriffs now within the state of Massachusetts are going to lead a pilot where all three forms of, of evidence-based um, FDA approved medications will be, will be available to the populations um, in those facilities. So they'll be addressing a maintenance protocol, clients, individuals who are coming to the jail with a verified, verified prescription based on the recommendation of a qualified addiction special, a specialist. In other words, 
not going to be a security decision, but rather a medically based with a qualified addiction specialist. In addition, they'll be looking at MAT for induction, those suffering from a substance use disorder 30 days prior to release, again, based on a recommendation of a qualified addiction specialist. And let me say too, let's all remember, these are for individuals, it's all voluntary. None of this can be um, imposed unless there's a court order, but that's a, a different conversation. But with our sheriffs and our jails, we're talking about those that are volunteering to participate. In addition, the exciting thing about Massachusetts and the sheriff is they're going to have a very data heavy driven collection process. They're gonna be looking at the cost of providing MAT, security type of issues, post-release community capacity to treat, recidivism, relapse, and harm reduction. And for those of you who may know Sheriff uh, Katusian, who's truly one of our leaders, he is a data-driven sheriff who's already collecting great data. If you're looking at what are some of the great data points we currently could be um, collecting, please reach out to me and or Sheriff Katusian with the Middlesex Mass um, Sheriff's um, Office. So again, these are just some of the sheriffs that would be participating. And again, I don't wanna spend too much time. You're happy to um, go back to these slides. They'll be talking about the medication and program um, participation. What does it mean? The treatment and programming, what all of that will entail. And the reporting requirements that they're gonna be providing every six months. So it's really exciting to see the great work that our sheriffs are doing, are doing as they're uh, really um, taking a very strong lead in helping to um, address our populations um, coming to us uh, with uh, substance use and or opiate use um, disorders. Implementation plans are also gonna be discussed um, and talked about with the um, Massachusetts pilot program as well. And the implementation and effective dates, as you'll see already coming up now, uh, we are very, very close to seeing our sheriffs kick off this pilot program and we will be um, excited to share all those results um, as we move forward. And as I move forward, I, I wanna share with you some of the resources and technical assistance that um, the national sheriffs are able to provide in addition to our great partners at SAMHSA and, and the GAIN Center. Um, there is the link to the Promising Practices Guidelines, in, which by the way, is not the most recent as you heard from um, John Berg regarding um, SAMHSA's most released documents. We also have some recent webinars um, if you're interested. But most of all, I just wanna encourage each one of you, reach out to your federal partners. SAMHSA is here, the GAIN Center is there to help and assist you. And we at the National Sheriffs are there to assist you in any way that we can. Please also reach out to your other federal partners at um, NIC and DJA. This is all about collaboration versus litigation. We are all there to help you and to get the needed resources and education. And I thank um, John Berg and I thank um, uh, uh, Melissa as well for um, really putting this together. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Sheriff Furman um, and uh, uh, Dr. Rye. All right, well, thank you. Uh, we, uh, on behalf of Dr. Rye and myself, we're very excited to be here today and uh, present to everybody. Um, I'm gonna start us off and, and really what I see my role is I'm gonna provide a little bit of background, but um, really in terms of this whole process um, as, a, as an administrator of a facilities um, is, is providing support. I know a lot of times um, there's some pushback from some of the security staff and, and even some sheriffs. Um, so I really see my role in this whole endeavor is, is providing support and providing um, just rationale for why we need to do this and why we need to have these programs in our facilities. Um, so to just start Denver, we're from Denver, Colorado. Uh, Denver has about uh, almost 700,000 residents. Uh, we're ranked as the 19th largest uh, U.S. city by population. Um, the Denver Sheriff Department is the largest sheriff's department in the state of Colorado. Uh, we're very unique in that Denver is a city county, and so we don't have any unincorporated areas to patrol. So uh, we focus our efforts on uh, two jail facilities, two courthouses, uh, and a civil warrants process uh, civil warrants and uh, uh, fugitive process. Um, we have about 844 sworn employees, 245 civilian. Uh, we run between our two facilities, 
uh, in eight, 2018, an average daily population of about 2,100 inmates. Um, we have a capacity of 2,330 beds. Uh, last year, we processed uh, 36,000 individuals through our facilities, uh, both in and out. Um, and uh, like a lot of facilities, a lot of my colleagues across the country, uh, two of the major things that, that we deal with um, is the, the opioid uh, substance use issues as well as mental health. Uh, we know through uh, data collection that um, although about a quarter of our intakes uh, have some type of mental health alert, uh, because they have a longer length of stay, uh, we, we found that uh, on any given day we have about 50% of our population uh, that has some sort of mental health alert. And so it's a, it's a critical issue for us in managing that population. Um, one of the things, too, that I think it's important uh, is to, for everybody to understand, even as Dr. Rice starts to talk about some of our programs, is uh, we have a very unique uh, relationship uh, with Denver Health. Denver Health is the, the city hospital. Um, we have a contract with Denver Health and a relationship with Denver Health where uh, they provide uh, medical services for both of our facilities, so they're our, our medical provider. Um, and we also have a, a unit at the hospital, so we have a locked unit in, in Denver Health uh, that we staff with deputies, uh, but it's basically a, a jail housing unit that, uh, that's at the hospital with um, a secure sally port and, and vehicle entry and everything. Uh, and that provides us with a lot of really unique opportunities, too, as it relates to uh, both medical and, and mental health care for our inmate population. Just in, in terms of some background, and, and we won't spend a lot of time on this, but um, you know, everybody knows the, the issue um, with opioids and with, uh, with drug use. Um, we know that it's a problem across the country. Uh, we know that in Denver, we've seen a rise over the last couple of years through our, our police department. We know that their seizures are up over 2,000% of heroin. Uh, the pounds of heroin seized is up by 1,500%. Uh, Arrests for uh, heroin is up 515%. Uh, and so we, we, like everyone else, are seeing an increase in this uh, and a challenge to uh, dealing with it. In terms of Colorado as a whole, um, back in 2002, this is a, a map um, of the various counties. Uh, Denver is in, almost in the very center. It's the very uh, small, dark uh, dot in the middle there. Um, and this map just points out the, the, um, the amount of issues and the amount of uh, overdose death rates uh, throughout Colorado. So this is from 2002. Uh, this map uh, is from 2014, and so it's, it's clear that uh, this is on the rise. Again, like many uh, counties across the country, an issue that uh, has become challenging to deal with. Uh, this is a map uh, specific to Denver, and it just shows the, uh, the Denver Fire Department, Denver Police Department use of naloxone in 2016. Uh, the, uh, the highlighted area there in the middle is where our downtown detention facility is located, the, the actual downtown of Denver. And so we see a, certainly an increased use uh, in that area. Uh, hi, this is Dr. Rai, and uh, I'll be taking over and I'll be talking about the MAX program in, um, in our facilities here. So, so what, what, what we are doing in Denver is, uh, you know, we, we are tailoring this uh, with medication this, as well as behavioral health therapies, um, and we provide all the three medications in our facility, methadone, buprenorphine, as well as naltrexone, both the injectable form as well as the oral form. Uh, so that's, that's what we are doing for our uh, facilities here. Uh, so, so the other things that we do is, uh, the, the other thing that we uh, often do is uh, we are um, doing harm reduction through our needle exchange. We do drug prevention continuum uh, by our law enforcement assisted division, uh, diversion program at DPD, our drug courts. Uh, you know, as, as part of Denver Health's hub and spoke model. And then, you know, when people get arrested, uh, we continue them on their treatment. And we also have what we call our RISE units, which is our substance use uh, treatment units in the county and city jail, where we do a lot of uh, group and individual therapies. Uh, so, you know, there's a whole uh, level of opiate intervention. Uh, we participate 
in coordination across systems. Uh, we do a bunch of things. We allow uh, continued dosing when they come in uh, on methadone by verifying their dose in the central registry. We do a short-term methadone induction, which is a four-day process. I'll talk about that. Uh, we do a jail-based MAD induction using Suboxone. Uh, and then we also uh, will induct on naltrexone, uh, Vivitrol injection if needed. And we also give naloxone at release uh, to people when they, uh, we put them in their property, basically. Uh, you know, the number of people in the jail uh, coming with this has continued to increase. It's gone up 58%. Uh, we've maintained methadone uh, while they've been in the facility. We've been doing this for a while, but this has, uh, uh, we've always maintained it, and that's been helpful because we didn't believe in like, withdrawing people and then they would relapse. So we've been able to successfully maintain people on methadone. Uh, you can see the number of methadone doses that we've been passing out um, in the facility from 2015 to 2016 to 2017. And uh, the, the reason why we're able to dose methadone is because the hospital which has the, uh, uh, sorry, the hospital which has the, uh, ability to give this because the hospital is a methadone clinic gives uh, uh, these doses to us at the jail after we verify the dose and uh, so the dosing occurs through that process. Uh, the uh, MAT induction, which is short-term detention-based, is a multi-agency coordination. We do coordinate with drug court, probation, Denver sheriffs, the hospital, uh, outpatient substance providers like OBHS and ARTS, where somebody comes in on Friday, they're sent to our jail-based unit in the hospital. They get inducted on methadone, and then uh, uh, four days later, they go back to outpatient uh, substance use treatment with a peer navigator. Uh, and so this is basically the court identifies the participant, you know, patient is inducted over the weekend, Monday they're released, and then they go back. Uh, so we've had a pretty good success on this one. Uh, a lot of the 48, you know, out of the refers, 58% did remain uh, on methadone. And uh, it was helpful when they had peers to assist them through this process. Uh, so, w how are we identifying people for induction? Basically, uh, we identify them as opioid use disorder with DSM-5 criteria. They at least have been sentenced here for two months in the jail. They have to agree to be on this treatment. They are not leaving the county jail for any other correctional facility. And if they are, have any core occurring mental illness, then we stabilize them on a psychiatric med before we do any kind of induction. Uh, the goal is, of course, to increase recovery, stability, uh, decrease likelihood of overdose, increase retention and treatment, and also decrease illicit opiate use. So, you know, this all, there's a combination of medications, individual and group therapies provided, coordination with community providers upon release, which is predominantly Denver Health. And then we, uh, you, we uh, follow up with Denver Health to see how many people do show up for their appointment and remain in treatment as a way of outcome measurement. Uh, so what uh, is our main resource? Our core team consists of a PA, uh, two registered nurses uh, who provide the medication, uh, two therapeutic case managers who do the intake as well as individual and group therapy, two community case managers who follow up with the patients on release for up to 30 days as well as co uh, connect them to community resources, one uh, clinical supervisor who's a licensed social worker who supervises the MAT program, and then we have two clerical support specialists at the jail itself. Uh, and then our initial pilot was to have at least 150 people on um, Suboxone, continue 50 people in the community on Suboxone, maintain 200 people on, uh, on methadone, at least 100 people to be offered Vivitrol. Uh, we uh, did wildly exceed except expectations, except for the Vivitrol, I think we kind of uh, went above and beyond in our first year pilot program. Uh, the Naltrans was sustained uh, injection is another thing that we were able to buy through a grant. and. Uh, uh, because that would be helpful for us. Uh, the jail has an agreement with the hospital. Uh, we, we have what we call, uh, a de we get a decreased rate for the medication because of the hospital being a public health entity. So we are able to get the medication at a substantially lower uh, cost. And that's helped us in buying the, uh, the injection because it's pretty expensive. Uh, again, and we also give Narcan to everybody who is uh, positive on opiate use disorder on the intake screening. Our substance use nurses who are doing the withdrawal protocol will give Naloxone, uh, put that in the kit. Uh, and then also, uh, you know, Naloxone has also been carried off by all safety officers, whether it's fire, police, sheriff, park rangers. Um, 
as well as our librarians in the library. Uh, and we give this naloxone out on release. Uh, the Colorado Office of Behavioral Health is very helpful in, uh, in supporting us in this endeavor. So looking at a, d a data analysis, what we did in uh, last year, 2,900 individuals approximately claimed opioid dependence. Uh, 1,900 of them were moderate to severe. 344 were inducted on Suboxone. And then uh, we screened approximately 1,828 individuals uh, before we uh, selected those uh, 344 individuals. Uh, and then so the number of people who were ultimately enrolled were 174, 63 followed up in the clinic, and then 61 did not of those returned back to custody. So it, it was helpful for us to know that some people who were repeatedly coming back in the jail did not come back. They stayed in treatment, and they were uh, no longer coming back for drug-related charges. Uh, and then you can see our uh, stats for uh, our uh, program, uh, we use buprenorphine to withdraw people. Uh, we do a three-day taper. Uh, so uh, you could see we, ha we served at least 1,100 people on the, on the withdrawal protocol. Uh, again, we did 344 inductions. Uh, we continued 300 people separately on Suboxone when they came inside the facility. We continued 319 people who were already on methadone when they came in. We gave 190 people oral naltrexone, and we gave 28 people injectable. Uh, I would like to turn this over to our next presenter. Thank you so much for uh, listening to our talk. Hello. Um, this is Jennifer Clark, Dr. Clark. Uh, thank you for inviting me for this presentation. I'm going to talk about the Rhode Island uh, program. Let's see if I can get to the next slide here. So Rhode Island is unique. We're a very small state. We have no county jails. We're a combined system. Uh, we have an average daily census of about 3,000, but we have over 12,000 people who come through the system every year. And as a little bit of history for our program, uh, in the past we had methadone maintenance only for pregnant women. Uh, but methadone withdrawal was available for the past 20 years. So people who came, on method, came into the facility on methadone were continued for uh, seven days and then decreased by about two to five milligrams a day. Uh, and then over the, uh, before we started our program, we started to increase the amount of time that people were uh, maintained on their methadone. Buprenorphine, otherwise known as Suboxone, was rarely provided, and most people were immediately withdrawn. In August of 2015, the governor put together a task force uh, of multiple different agencies uh, and uh, stakeholders to come up with a plan for the state to uh, improve and decrease mortality from uh, opiate overdose deaths. Uh, the goal was initially to reduce opioid overdose deaths by one-third within three years. We did not reach that goal, but we did uh, turn, uh, we did decrease the number of overdose deaths. Uh, and the treatment strategy is that every door is the right door. So we meet patients, uh, we meet people where they are, and if somebody has a specific treatment, uh, in mind, we're going to help work with the patient as much as possible. There were four main areas uh, where the funds were targeted for treatment, and one was the criminal justice system, and uh, we obtained $2 million of funding. Our goals initially were to screen everyone upon uh, commitment and then uh, conduct assessments as appropriate, uh, provide MAT, for three different populations. So the first population was people coming in on MAT. We wanted to continue them for six to 12 months. Uh, we plan to initiate MAT upon commitment uh, and initiate MAT prior to release. Again, we are a combined system, so we, did not, we don't have to worry about people going from a jail to a prison. Everyone in the state uh, will, who's incarcerated will stay within our system. Uh, we also want to work towards a seamless community transition uh, and provide comprehensive MAT services. So this is an overview of uh, 
how we saw people come through the system. We have at intake, people are screened. There's a possibility because of the very quick turnover that sometimes people weren't screened. If somebody screens negative, then we're done with them. If positive, we do a urine screen uh, the night of commitment. Uh, if that is positive, they're seen for an assessment and then evaluated for MAT. Uh, so this I don't really need to go over, but just it shows that we went stepwise. We didn't go from uh, zero to 80. We um, began different pieces of the, of the project uh, and kept adding on things. This is our average uh, daily uh, MAT doses. I'm wondering if this pen works. Oh, it does. Uh, so you can see that early on when we started, uh, there were, you know, 20, 20 to 40 people at any one time on MAT. As our program expanded, uh, we got up to over 250. We're now up over 300 people a day on MAT. And uh, 350, uh, 450 per month go through the system on MAT. And uh, this graph is showing the number of people that are released each month. So we have over 100 um, uh, people released each month on MAT. The vast majority, uh, or the majority, are on methadone. We have. Uh, about 59% were on methadone, 2% on naltrexone, and 39% uh, on buprenorphine. Uh, again, the majority were people that continued from the community. We had uh, over, this is a, a one-year period, we had uh, almost 500 people inducted on commitment, and then pre-release inductions, 104. Those numbers have gone uh, down now because we have fewer people that have actually come off of MAT, so fewer people needing induction prior to release. And then follow-up in the uh, community, that differed by the type of um, how they were started on MAT or continued. So people who are continued on MAT, uh, over 90% followed up in the community. This was good to know that uh, when we were putting our resources towards the population in the greatest need, uh, that people who continued, we didn't have to put a lot of resources there. Where we had the lowest follow-up rate was people who were newly inducted. Uh, and this could be people in for two or three days, so we don't have a lot of time with them or a lot of time to get them stabled on, stabilized on treatment. But this is 177 people that would not have followed up would not have been on treatment if it were not for our program. And then as far as the success of the program, we, we were really focused on mortality. And what we found when we looked at a six-month period uh, before the program and during the program, we had over a 61% uh, relative risk reduction in mortality. So we went from 26 deaths uh, to nine deaths from overdose. And that was you know, the beginning of the program. So we saw a huge decrease uh, overall, if you look at the state, uh, for people who had not had a prior incarceration, uh, the decrease in mortality was only 3%. So our program at the DOC drove down the mortality rate of the state, so there was a decrease of 12%. Uh, challenges and lessons learned, it's really all about teamwork. It's not... Um, it's not security versus medical. Uh, we work together hand in hand. Uh, I can't emphasize it enough. You know, people have come uh, and asked about our program and asked to visit, and they don't bring any security staff with them. Uh, it's not going to be successful. Your program's not going to work if you don't have security staff on board and working with you. Uh, communicate, communicate, communicate. Uh, we. Uh, one thing, we, we probably didn't um, meet enough early on, uh, but really uh, open doors, open communication. Uh, we've really learned a lot, and it has helped us in so many other areas of healthcare services. Uh, 
there was a lot of skepticism. I mean, we started uh, over three years ago. I think uh, the, the climate has changed. Uh, I think people realize more about how important uh, MAT is for saving lives uh, and how it is uh, important for people to function in their lives after release. Uh, diversion was a big issue for us early on, uh, especially with the buprenorphine. Uh, we did uh, try to work closely with security. We changed from uh, pills to film, we crushed the pills, and we're uh, moving towards injectables, but we uh, actually currently use all, all forms of uh, buprenorphine. We are very lucky in that the way our program is run is through Kodak, which is a uh, substance, uh, it's an opiate treatment provider in the community. They have six sites uh, throughout the state, so when a patient is enrolled in the program within the uh, jail, they are also automatically enrolled in the community so that the transition is seamless. They don't have to wait to get enrolled in the community. Uh, uh, diversion, the one problem we had was uh, that in our system, any, uh, any kind of diversion was only marked as contraband, so we couldn't track uh, any changes. Uh, we've now changed our tracking system so that if there's any medication that's diverted, it's uh, entered as medication, uh, and then it'll say MAT or non-MAT. So it, the improvement in tracking system was very important. Uh, start slow. We were under a lot of pressure when we started uh, to, to have results quickly. Uh, I'd suggest not doing what we did. Start slow, work with everybody, uh, and, and communicate with all of your providers and security. I underestimated uh, the needs, the workspace, the time it would take. Uh, we needed to get more nurses on board, uh, and, and that took a while. Screening. Um, we. I uh, initially thought it would be very important to have uh, an evidence-based screening process done by, uh, on every patient that came in. We have actually moved away from that, and I think it might be because uh, the program is so well known in the state that all we have to do is have the nurses ask, have you used opiates? And if they say yes, then the patient is referred to the MA. T program. doesn't mean that they start MAT, it just means they, they move on to have an assessment done. Um, initially, we had a hard time uh, starting uh, treatment, uh, getting to the patients in time, uh, and what we found was that we had a lot of negative urines and that um, made it difficult for a documentation of addiction, so we moved the urine screening to the night of admission. Uh, we also have had a lot of people released before we could start treatment. Uh, dosing, uh, film dissolves faster than tablets, so security was very happy with me when I moved to the tablets. Uh, they're also happier now that we've moved to crushing, so again, working with security. Very important, don't dose at night. Uh, it, uh, it's not as safe. It's ideal to give in the morning because uh, for people with opiate use disorder, the medication is activating and it'll keep people awake at night if you start, um, uh, if you dose too late. Uh, people on work release, we are keeping them on treatment no matter how long they're in. Length of sentence, so we initially had six months to a year. We've now moved to up to four years and getting uh, over 95% of people with opiate use disorder will continue MAT throughout uh, their incarceration. Uh, successes, we had higher than expected follow-up in the community, strong security support with many ideas coming from officers. Uh, and uh, we've been working towards, uh, and the officers are, are quite enthusiastic about putting together a therapeutic community in uh, the intake center so we can have more people housed together and uh, that will allow for easier treatment and coordination. 
So thank you very much for your time, and I'm going to move it on to our host. All right, thank you so much. So I, I hope all of you got as much out of those presentations as I did, and we now have some time for questions. So if you uh, will submit your questions in the Q&A portal, we'll cover as many as we can before the end of the, the webinar. So uh, one question that has already been submitted, uh, and I think this may go to Carrie, how are the jails violating any rights to services available in the general public? If they choose not to access these services prior to incarceration, how does this go back on the facilities? Uh, Melissa, I'm going to have you read part of that, that question again because I, I only heard a part of it. Okay. How are the jails violating any rights for services available in the general public? If they, meaning uh, people coming into the jails, choose not to access these services prior to incarceration, how does this go back on the facilities? All right. So, so really, really good question. For the most part, what we have been talking about is, um, as I've been talking about some of the litigation, it's individuals who are coming into the facility with a valid prescription. And those, <clears throat> excuse me, that do not test positive for benzos, you know, or other type of, of medications, right? These are individuals who have a valid, a valid prescription and then the continuity. Um, so as we talk about those individuals in the community who have been a part of the system, and then validating that is, is one system. But then you're right, what do we do about individuals who are using heroin or who are using illicit drugs, whatever they may be, and then they come into the facility and then what's kind of the protocol there? And that's one of the areas um, where we are working with the federal partners on trying to at some point putting forth protocols um, for, um, what type of, what I will call, medically managed withdrawal. Um, it, are there proper protocols for those who are coming in on illicit medications, who chose never to be a part of, of MA, any MAT in the community prior to? So I don't look at it in terms of liability and litigation. When I look at it in terms of the individual coming into the facility and how do they present. And I, and I really appreciated how Dr. Clark presented it. We, take, we accept people as they are. And then the question becomes, if it's a serious medical need under the deliberate indifference test, and we have knowledge of that, then how do we in fact address that? And that is a medical, it's a clinical decision, which may um, include um, some type of med um, MAT um, medication. Um, I'm not a doctor, so I can't speak to that. It may involve some type of medically assisted withdrawal, um, but what we're trying to do is really change a little bit of the mindset that just because somebody is on an illicit um, drug does not mean that we may not have to, in fact, provide some type of care. We have many individuals who come to us, and let's say, let's not even talk about opiate use disorder or substance abuse disorder. Somebody could be diabetic, somebody could have a heart condition, very different. Um, and or they could be abusing medications or what have you, and how do they present and how do we treat that? Now, I'm not comparing any of these together, but what, I'm, what I am saying is we do greet each individual that comes into our facility, and then it'll be a clinical decision based on that individual. Um, now, in addition, somebody may not be on a protocol, but that's when we might be looking at the induction for when they leave to and setting up a protocol for reentry into the community and what might that look like. And that's why I'm encouraging each one of you, if, as you're looking at MAT in your facility, please reach out to any of us on the call and by all means, SAMHSA and the Gain Center, because we can do peer-to-peer -peer and help you with jails who are the same size as you are, whether you're rural or urban, and look at what's available in your community and help with the peer-to-peer, -peer, someone that already has a system may be similar to help you um, to see some of the challenges that they overcame in this area. So I hope that I answered your question and I, didn't, I wasn't trying to skirt it. I just, I don't like to look at it in terms of liability, but rather how do we treat every individual result regardless of when they enter the facility. Thank you, Carrie. Um, do our other presenters have any comment in response to that question?
No, I think that okay. was a great answer. Okay, great. I, I think along the same lines, um, someone else asked, what do you suggest in an area where the climate has not changed um, towards uh, an openness of, towards using MAT? How did you overcome the too bad, they're criminals mindset? And that was in um, parenthesis, that was in quotation marks. Um, and so that, you know, Carrie also, if you could respond to that and, and any of the panelists after Carrie finishes, we welcome your response. Um, well, actually, I, I'm going to turn it over to the sheriff here in just a minute because I think, um, I think he's really going to be in a, in a wonderful position, but um, you're absolutely right. Um, what do we do in that situation where we, we might have to, to maybe change how we look at things? as we have with many other issues that present. Um, we also, um, the jails have become the, the uh, literally um, um, hospitals for those um, who have mental health challenges. And we weren't designed for that as well, but that doesn't mean that we, we close our eyes. And so how do we address the challenges? That's one of the reasons why initially um, NSA work, working with our federal partners and especially SAMHSA worked initially on the release of the jail-based medication-assisted promising practices guidelines for the field to help educate the field. Um, many times we've had um, facilities that have said, nope, we are a non-narcotic facility. I already kind of talked about that. Um, but the answer is we are dealing with individuals dying daily, not just in the jail. We're talking about throughout the United States. Our jails are a reflection of our communities. They are a mirror of our communities, and we can no longer close our eyes to that. And so um, many, many of our sheriffs, the philosophy is that we, we want people to leave our facilities better than when they came in. Um, and again, um, although these are, this is an unfunded mandate, so to speak, we do have a constitutional right, or inmates have a constitutional right to medical care. We know we have a duty to treat. We know this is a new area. It's MAT is new in the community. It's new in the jails. So by the great work that SAMHSA is doing with the release of their documents, by the release of the document in November, by way of these uh, uh, webinars, we're helping to educate the field. And if it's one jail at a time, one sheriff at a time talking about that experiences, hopefully we can help to maybe change the mindset, and I would prefer instead of maybe change the mindset, let's expand our lens. Let's start to see this through a different lens of saving lives, not just because they're individuals involved in the criminal justice system. But I think, um, Sheriff Furman, um, you really are really one of the leaders in this area, and how did you kind of come about this, and how do you address it with your fellow sheriffs throughout the United States? You know, I, I think this goes to a kind of a, a overall bigger picture of, um, you know, we talk about changing a culture, um, and, and not just in an individual sheriff's department, but in, as an industry. Um, you know, we look at it from uh, really how do we how we treat people, and so we we kind of have a comprehensive approach here that we're looking at it, and it goes all the way from, um, you know, we, we've redone our use of force policy. We're looking at how we utilize force and when we utilize force. Uh, I talked earlier about the amount of mental health issues that we're dealing with. Um, and same thing with the, the individuals with substance use issues. And so really our focus is on, um, we, we want our staff to start to see people as individuals. Uh, we've, spent a, we've spent decades as an industry dehumanizing the inmate population. I think a lot of it um, you know, was encouraged as we moved from linear supervision to direct supervision and we became uh, very concerned about, you know, over-familiarization when we started putting deputies inside housing units. Um, and, and I think now we need to take a step back and, and help staff understand that, um, you know, the, uh, these are people. These are, these are human beings. Um, these are individuals with issues. Um, and so whether we're looking at it from a mental health standpoint or we're looking at it from a substance use standpoint, um, that's really been our emphasis is, is how do we help staff understand um, that, 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 that there's a difference. And so, you know, we, we spend a lot of time, like when we do our, our crisis intervention training, uh, a large portion of that training is done in the community uh, with individuals that are experiencing mental health issues and drop-in centers, uh, really to help them, uh, help our staff see individuals that aren't in crisis while they're not in crisis. Everybody that we deal with on a daily basis is in crisis in some way. So 
Uh, we've had uh, command staff meetings. We've taken them to the Harm Reduction Center in Denver uh, and held meetings there again so that they can uh, see that side of life. Um, you know, unfortunately, everybody we deal with when they come into a correctional facility is in crisis. And so I think it's important uh, as we start to, to work with staff to try to help them understand, um, again, that, that there's a need for, for treatment. Um, and again, there's a balance there because we, you know, we, as we bring in new staff, um, they don't quite understand the, the nature of the, the inmate culture and the security issues with that. And so there certainly has to be a balance because I think uh, if you don't provide a balance for staff, then, then of course it's all, all we care about is the inmates. Um, but there has to be a balanced approach so that staff understand that, uh, you know, we care about their health and we care about their wellness. Um, and, and part of that is, is uh, caring about how they understand uh, the nature of our MA population and how we treat one another. And Melissa, um, I'd yes. like to share, because I, I think the sheriff, um, I'd like to share, just kind of piggyback on what the sheriff said. Um, some of the great uh, successes um, really help to change the dial and the difference that um, correctional officers and correctional deputies can make in the lives of um, individuals who have substance use and opiate use disorders. Um, we had a situation in Franklin County, Ohio, and we were actually meeting with the then um, acting director, um, a drug czar, um, and two women who had successfully completed the pathway programs in Franklin County, Ohio. We're talking with, at that time, Acting Director Baum about their success um, with their program. And one of the things that Ohio does, or Franklin County, Ohio does really well is does middle sex math, is they have recovery coaches um, and their staff are, are CIT trained, as the sheriff just mentioned. Anyway, as these women went out, we were talking with Acting Director Baum, one of the things that they said was with their success, when they went back into the community and they were at a point where they might relapse, they didn't call family, they didn't call friends, they didn't call anybody else. The first person that they called was their CIT officer assigned to them in the jail. And that speaks volumes about the impact that a jail can have and a deputy and officer in the lives of somebody who's going through um, this um, uh, opiate use um, disorder. And so um, can we change everyone's mind? Maybe not, um, but can we do it um, maybe one facility at a time and, and one story at a time? And that's truly, I think, has been the mission. Our sheriffs are out there not only looking at programs to educate in the, um, in, in the schools about um, opiate use disorder, um, and we're doing everything we can as far as partnering um, together, that we're all working together. And again, I applaud SAMHSA and the Gain Center because this is one great avenue where we bring everyone together to try to help, you know, kind of find out who has what resources and what technical assistance to help. And so hopefully this webinar is just one way to maybe, maybe it's helped to change or maybe open open the lens for somebody who maybe was closed off to this before. But I think that story in Franklin County is really uplifting. Uh, thank you both, Carrie and uh, Sheriff Furman for your thoughts on that. Um, we have a few questions that are, are a little bit different, but they all center around more of the practical day-to-day -day application of the MAT program inside a jail. Um, one person asked, how is MAT offered when an offender is only in the jail for 48 to 72 hours? How do you verify a prescription? So um, whoever would like to respond to that? Uh, I, I can talk about this. Uh, for methadone, when they come in and they're on methadone already, uh, they, uh, our nursing staff uh, will fax the, the dose to our uh, methadone clinic at the hospital, which has uh, contact with the central regist registry in the state and will verify where the person, which methadone clinic the person goes to and uh, what is the dose they were getting. And then they will give that courtesy dose to us at the jail the next day to give the person. For, uh, for Suboxone, uh, all, uh, most, all of my charge nurses, uh, the, I've delegated for them to look up prescription drug monitoring program in the state, which is called PDMP. Uh, and that they can look up and look if somebody has prescribed Suboxone, what is the prescription dose, who prescribed it 
how many doses were they prescribed, uh, and what is the strength, and then that is how we, uh, uh, we that, that is online, real time, so they can look at that, and then they just start the person on that medication. Uh, the only challenge we sometimes get is somebody's on a daily dosing of Suboxone, then you actually have to call the methadone clinic and then verify that. But usually it's pretty straightforward. Within 24 to 48 hours, you're able to verify somebody's dose. Same thing in Rhode Island. Uh, usually the, they come in, the commitment is at night and the verifications are done first thing in the morning. And we get the medication the same day. Okay. Great, thank you. And uh, another person asked, and I, I think this is probably more of, of what you all think or your opinions on this, but um, this person asked if the buprenorphine films dissolve quickly, why are crushed pills preferred by security? Do, do any of you feel comfortable responding to that question? I can respond to it. The, uh, the film is easier to uh, divert. It's uh, kind of flesh colored, so if an officer is doing a mouth check uh, and people are breathing through their, their mouths, uh, the film can be moved to the roof of the mouth um, and, then, uh, and then diverted. Whereas with the crushed tablets, they're white uh, and it's uh, pretty obvious um, that it's still in the mouth. Uh, and I can add that the other thing about films was that uh, when we initially gave films, we had a lot of people mailing in films from outside, and it was difficult sometimes to know whether somebody was getting the films as a contraband versus uh, somebody getting the film uh, as a treatment, I mean, at least for the deputies, because they didn't know who was getting the treatment. Uh, but the crushed pills we are giving now is a box on, uh, you know, we know if somebody's getting a mailed in film, it's, a, it's something from outside. And in addition, when you're talking about um, the films, um, uh, so we do know that Suboxone is one of our number one contraband items in the jail. One of the ways it comes in most easily, as um, the doctor mentioned, was through um, mail. And one of the creative ways that the jails throughout the United States are beginning to address that is to scan personal mail. And so that um, mail that could have been soaked in, you know, Suboxone or film or what have you, no longer comes into the facility, but rather it would be scanned either at a kiosk or they could they could get a scanned copy just to help reduce some of those contraband concerns. But film is, is a very um, is a very significant concern um, within the facility. Thank you. And uh, now we have a question about more, more, it's more of a treatment question, so I'll look to Dr. Rai and Dr. Clark to respond to this one. Um, why do people need to stay on MAT so long? And uh, this person asked, when do you start weaning them off? And I'll add to that, um, you know, what are the appropriate protocols for determining if someone should be weaned off? Uh, so in, um, well, I guess not in Rhode Island, but a general guidelines, there is no preset time that somebody needs to be on MAT. Uh, I think general opinion is that by the time people come to a criminal justice system, their, their disease is at such a point where they potentially may need to stay on a treatment lifelong. Uh, if somebody has not used a substance for very long, we are often able to get them off. But I think you really have to work with your patients. Uh, they often, you know, know that they need to stay on a medication. Uh, it's a chronic relapsing brain disease, and the risks of taking people off too soon are greater than the risks of keeping people on. We know mortality rates are higher for people who've been, um, who've gone to uh, withdrawal or sort of called detox uh, units. So it, the goal isn't to get a person off of treatment. The goal is to keep people on treatment as appropriate. Uh, and I'll just add, like, I think uh, we need to conceptualize opioid use disorder as any kind of chronic illness, just like any other illness, you wouldn't take them off their treatment just uh, because they're in the jail or prison. I don't think so. It's appropriate for us to wean them off. You know, when patients ask me uh, when they can come off of it, I tell them there are 
uh, you know, when you are internally feeling stable and when your environment is stable, then maybe you can talk to your provider and slowly get tapered off if you really want to. But, but if any of those components are not stable, then I would hesitate to say you're getting off the medication just because you feel you don't want to take it. I think you need stability both internally as well as externally before you think about uh, weaning yourself off. Thank you both for that. Uh, we have a couple, uh, about three questions around funding. So I'd like to spend some time talking about funding. Um, one person asked, how is MAT funded? Are sheriff's departments paying out of pocket, using grants, billing for services? Uh, one person did ask specifically, does Denver allow Medicaid to be billed inside your facility? So um, Sheriff Furman and Dr. Rye, you might want to explain how you all are providing and funding the, the MAT program in your jail. But um, also I would like to hear from um, Dr. Clark about funding as well. Uh, so I can talk about Denver. Colorado is a Medicaid expansive state, um, and Denver has been um, unique in the sense that we've been able to get 96% of the people who leave the jail on Medicaid uh, when they leave the jail. When somebody comes inside the jail, the Department of uh, Human Services for Denver, uh, they screen them, they do their uh, paperwork for their Medicaid, and they leave the paperwork with the patient. And when the patient leaves, they just sign off that paperwork and uh, deliver it, and their Medicaid becomes active in a couple of days. Uh, in between, we give them bridge prescription uh, for up to five days for that time frame. Uh, initially, when we started, we started as a pilot program, so we got grants from both uh, the state targeted grant that uh, the federal government released, as well as uh, uh, Colorado also you know, legalized marijuana, so all of that marijuana dollars uh, go to, uh, uh, some of that excess money went to a Signal, which is our substance use uh, 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 authority. It's a kind of like uh, Health Insurance Authority, but for substance use, and Signal gave us the funding to start the program. Uh, and we've been able to move half of that now on the city's budget because the city pays for the services, and half of it is still grant funded. So uh, that's a combination of things that we've been able to use to get uh, to pay for this. Me uh, Medicaid doesn't, is not active when people are in the jail, so we don't use that, but when they get out, it becomes active pretty quickly for us in Colorado. And one of the things that um, I can mention too is that we are very much looking at the Medicaid issue, understanding that um, uh, the Medicaid does not apply for our, that Medicaid exclusion um, does not apply for our pretrial detainees in the facility. And that's an initiative that NSA is working on right now. If you'd like more information uh, with, with NACO, um, please reach out and we can talk about it. Um, but one of the other, one of the other uh, uh, please know that USDA, your other federal partners for rural communities, uh, SAMHSA, um, BJA, all have extraordinary grants. They're also really working on trying to release some of the, uh, what I would call some of the restrictions with those grants. We're also really trying to work with our federal partners to make sure that the monies get to the counties, not necessarily to the state and then trickle down, but how do we get it so that um, our, our jails um, can get some of those resources a little bit sooner. Um, but there's a lot of different avenues, and I know that if you reach out um, to any of us, we could, we could also kind of talk some of those things offline as well. And in Rhode Island, it was put in the general uh, budget. So these are, for our program, it's all state funded. All right. Um, and someone else asked uh, another question around cost. Um, they asked if you, if any of you are tracking or have information on any rising costs associated with providing MAT services. For example, do you see increase in provider costs, lab costs, et cetera, within your jails? So for the for Denver, you know, we had to sep uh, we have a separate team for this purpose, and so. The cost of funding that team definitely was uh, is a cost, and then the cost of medications is definitely a cost. Uh, so those two things we were able to get it uh, in place, you know, as through a combination of grant and then the city paying for half of that. 
So we haven't tracked all of the costs. We have, you know, we know that we spend $2 million a year on, on the program, but that doesn't take into account any cost savings in that people are no longer uh, sick when they, um, when they come in. Uh, complications from withdrawal, we're not seeing that anymore. Okay, thank you. Um, just a couple more uh, questions before we move to um, our closing slides. We have a number of resources that we would like to share you, with you all. So we won't be able to get to all of these questions, but um, one person did ask, how come pregnant women can utilize some MAT options but not others? And I think that that is a common trend we see across the nation with some jails just limiting MAT for pregnant women. So does, is, do any of you feel comfortable answering that question? Uh, I can talk about Denver. So, so the jail in Denver is not an uh, is not an OTP. It's not a narcotic treatment program. So we can't induct them on methadone. The only people we can induct is if we send them to the hospital. And because with pregnant women, the risk is so high, uh, both to the baby and to the mother, that we, as a protocol, the moment somebody comes into the jail is pregnant and is using heroin. Uh, we just send it to the jail uh, uh, unit, medical unit in the hospital, and then they get inducted with methadone, and then they come back to us. Uh, everybody else, we induct on Suboxone in the jail, and uh, we maintain methadone, but methadone induction is specifically done just for pregnant women. So I think uh, just to expand on that, because methadone, there's so many more regulations around methadone, that's why it, it's difficult for some, some jails. Because we have a licensed OTP site here in Rhode Island, we can use either medication. Okay. All right, thank you. So um, that's all the time we have for the questions. And um, now we have three products available for download, and we want to give you all a few minutes to to download those to your computers. And what you should see is a box called File Transfer should be popping up on your computers. And shortly, you will see a file name um, come up for each of the three documents that you see on this slide. Um, medication Assisted Treatment Inside Correctional Facilities Addressing Medication Diversion is one of the um, documents available. Also, the SAMHSA document that John Berg mentioned at the beginning of our presentation, use of medication-assisted treatment for opioid use disorders in the criminal justice settings, that is also available for download. And then finally, SAMHSA released a document called Medication-Assisted Treatment in the Criminal Justice System Guidance to the States. And uh, this guidance is more, it's more shaped towards your state-level um, policymakers and leaders. So all three of these are um, here now popping up on the file transfer box. What you do is just click on the file name for the one that you want to download. So if you want to download MAT Diversion, just click on that. It should highlight, and then the download button should be green, uh, gray, and you can click download. That will then put the file directly on your computer. Alternately, if you would like to find these online, simply go to your favorite search engine and enter SAMHSA store and search for that. Uh, the SAMHSA store website should, should pop up. And you can also search for each of these documents on the SAMHSA store if you feel more comfortable downloading these directly from the SAMHSA website. We also have a certificate of webinar attendance that is popping up in the file transfer box. And again, this is just for personal portfolio use. We do not um, award CEU credits. Finally, if you um, 
want to receive our slides and the recording of this webinar, make sure you are signed up for the Game Center's listserv. We also provide monthly newsletters that, um, that cover information about um, behavioral health and criminal justice. So um, uh, sign up if you're interested in receiving those. And finally, um, we hope you'll join us for our next webinar. Um, SAMHSA's Game Center is really excited to present uh, a webinar on July 30th on effective data and information sharing, navigating common challenges. So we know many of you across the jurisdiction, across the nation, um, really um, are, are facing challenges in sharing data and information. So uh, we hope to address some of those issues in our webinar on July 30th, starting at 1.30. Eastern Time. And um, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Hill, Dr. Rye, Dr. Clark, and Chair Furman. Um, the information you provided today was invaluable. So we really appreciate you being with us today. Um, and if any of you are participating want more information, please don't hesitate to reach out to the Gain Center. Here's our website and uh, direct phone line. If you would like, to, if you're interested in any phone based technical assistance. Thank you so much for joining us, and we hope to see you next time. Have a good afternoon.